Whilst we're off looking for red, in comes green. Red is the color of lust, but green is what lust leaves behind. In heart, in womb. Whilst we're off looking for red, in comes green. I think that's a line that encapsulates the entirety of Garwin's quest in this film. He begins as a young, directionless man caught in the desire for honour and greatness to match the Knights of Camelot, yet also showing no drive, whiling his days away with drink, faintly hoping for greatness to come falling into his lap. This is the red Garwin desires, and yet is both literally and figuratively impotent of. The camel. This is the red of wine, of blood. Surely your knights have spilt enough blood in your name to bind them closer to you than I. The glory of war and triumph to be related in tales, and when the Christmas feast in Camelot turns to talk of red... Can regale me and my queen with some myth or canto of thine own papa? Then comes green, crashing through the halls atop a horse. Garwin sees in this his chance to win honour and steps forwards to meet the Green Knight's challenge. Whomsoever can land a blow against him, be it a nick on the cheek or a deep wound, shall win his axe. Its glory and riches shall be thine. However, one year on, such a person must travel to the Green Knight's Green Chapel and accept the same blow in return. As Garwin leaps across the table to meet this challenge, he kicks over his wine cup. He expects a fight with the Green Knight, to have to show courage in the face of a much bigger foe, however when the Green Knight lays down his axe, Garwin does not reassess the situation beyond asking only What do you expect me to do? rather than What should I do? And when the Green Knight now presents his neck, Garwin grows in conviction. This is a classic honourable battle to the death. With a great strike he can win reward. Never forget what happened here upon this Christmas day. He draws blood from his opponent. The Green Knight, of course, cannot return the blow if he lies dead. If. One year hence. And now, next Christmas, Garwin is bound to travel to the Green Chapel to meet the Green Knight for his own beheading. While searching for red, in came green, the colour of rot, of death, and the movement of life. Suddenly the axe he has won and must take back to the chapel with him is less a symbol of honour than a heavy burden to carry. A symbol of death bearing great physical weight upon him as he traverses a mystical world permeated throughout with images of death. I think I've laboured that point enough now though. Um, the Green Knight is a fantastic film. As someone who has always loved the Fury and Myth but never found much love for any film or TV adaptations. Uh, some I enjoy but not love. This is the film I always hoped would be made without really knowing it. I tend to think our Furian films have never quite hit the heights they deserved because A they tend to fail at translating the deeply mystical feel of the myths in a way that David Lowry manages perfectly here, both because of the symbolic feel of the environment itself and also perhaps because he marries the growing Christianity of the time with Britain's pagan past here in a way that portrays paganism as equally beautiful and important rather than a base evil opposition to Christianity as it normally is. And B because often I think the more obvious stuff in the Arthurian myth can appear outdated to a more general audience nowadays, although arguably Tolkien did a good job translating some of it into The Lord of the Rings. What this film does is modernise his ideals of virtue and chivalry by taking an axe to them and creating a knightly quest that is anything but knightly. An unheroic hero's journey. You do this one thing. You return home changed man, an honourable man, just like that. Yes. Dev Patel is phenomenal in this film. In my opinion Oscar worthy, despite the fact a lot of his brilliance is subtle and underlying in ways that probably won't win him an Oscar. Garwin here is nothing like a noble knight though, he foolishly beheads a symbol of nature when he doesn't need to, he's uncharitable to a struggling peasant, discourteous to the spirit of Winifred. If I go in there and find it, what would you offer me in exchange? Why would you ask me that? Why would you ever ask me that? So the wrong thing to say to a woman who was in all probability raped by an attacker she thinks bears resemblance to Garwin. Perhaps he was the... Was he? No. Oh. 
You certain? Yes. And he has something of an affair behind the Lord of the House's back and spends most of the film metaphorically flinching at the possibility of death. And it works as a performance because Garwin isn't a bad person exactly. In most of these situations, he's young and a bit baffled, responding with a flawed humanity. Your head is on your neck, my lady. It might look like it is, but it is not. It is in the spring. Oh, well, how did it happen to get there? Such as in the moment where Winifred floats across the room towards him, he instinctively reaches out to try and check if she's real. What are you doing? Just... Do not touch me. It's the kind of ordinary action any naive man feeling lost and confused in this weirdly mystical world might have. Garwin is a mix between a young, hesitant man who feels terribly out of his depth and an ambitious man attempting to hide his naivety by living up to an honourable, knightly image that doesn't entirely make sense to him in the first place. The two examples I can think of where he does appear most knightly are both ones that ridicule it. When given directions by a peasant who has clearly lost all his family in war, Garwin responds My thanks to you. My thanks to you. In his best attempt at a noble sounding voice. My thanks. You know, which sounds like a knightly thing to say, only the situation is completely wrong for it. I said are my directions not worth anything to you? Or in possibly my favourite shot of the entire film, Garwin riding out trying to look as noble as he possibly can with this very rigid posture and fixed stare forwards. The determination with which he stares underpins the forced nature of it all, and as he gets closer to the camera, you begin to sense this isn't a man as confident as he's trying to look. Honour doesn't amount to very much at all in this film. Blood spill in the name of King Arthur is revealed as a horribly barren wasteland of bodies. All dead. All dead. No one to bury him. We see nature being cut down. In the film's ending, Garwin even gets a vision of how little the very glory and honour he's been chasing will actually amount to in the grand scheme of things. Arthur's court even appears dark and decayed, and it just leaves me to wonder how often such a select few people rise to such great heights chasing red, chasing more and more riches and power to the cost of all other life, power they never even use, only for it to all mean nothing in the end. Power seems trivial when you remember Green will take it all back. There can be no escape. I like that in the middle of that wonderful montage that is Garwin's vision of his future, we get a shot of him lying awake in bed next to a political wife he won't sleep with despite his journey having helped him find his potency, staring up what I take to be a picture of the questing beast. A creature in Arthurian myth that, among other things, symbolises the pointlessness of knightly quests when King Pellinor was said to, along with all his ancestors, spend their lives hunting after the questing beast for no reason beyond the sake of a quest itself. What was all this power and honour for? Which is perhaps a question Essel even asked earlier on in the film in different terms. Why greatness? Why is goodness not enough? It's a poignant question. In a world enveloped with nature and images of it taking back from humanity, in our own environmentally damaged world today, why do so many still go chasing red and build such tall and pointless castles? What drives a man, any man, what drives Garwin for greatness? If it all comes down to the colour green, then ultimately this is a film about not just accepting death, but accepting nature. Accepting our place within nature, not as kings who rule earth, but as inhabitants of a nature that will strike us back with the very same blow we dealt it. And really, what greater quest is there in life than that? Not in some nihilistic or despairing sense, but positively, to know yourself kneeling before nature and death and to say with conviction. Now I'm ready. I'm ready now. Symbolically, this is all our quests in a way, I think, when life turns from the ambition of youth to finding meaning beyond and eventually accepting mortality. Not death as an escape from pain or life as an escape from death, but as something that comes to its natural end at the feet of nature's green axe. The further we travel on that journey, the heavier the weight of death becomes until, with any luck, we too can say, I'm ready now.
Of course, the Green Knight carries an axe rather than a sword when it is axes that chop down trees, and this is a knight whose very game is to give back exactly the blow given to him. I think it's fitting also that Garwin's colour is yellow in this film, when that is a mix between red and green, the potential for both within, I suppose. A yellow that the chapel even is bathed in, until Garwin finally lets go of his desire, both for honour and for continuing life when suddenly it's green. You notice the shift even in the montage, he goes from staring out of a yellow lit window to a green portrait and a turquoise cast throne room. Does he actually die though? Well, the fact his mum likely conjured the green knight for him and that it gives him this stroke around the neck in a way that I see as playful and mothering. That would all imply he does live, as does the fact Garwin lives in the original text. And there's also one possible interpretation that the final line of Off with your head should be understood as Off you go back to Camelot now with your head rather than without it. My interpretation, I guess, is a yes and no. <laughs> From the final line we move to the title over a cut tree stump, which to me signals the cutting of his head, so yes, Garwin has been felled by an axe. This is nature, however, you might cut a tree, but wildlife will grow back in another form. Garwin dies, but is probably reborn again in a symbolic sense. I think cutting to a title card that vaguely alludes to his death emphasises that symbolism much better than showing him alive still would. I mean, after all, if the Green Knight does truly give back the exact same blow Garwin gave him, then we have to remember Garwin's strike didn't technically kill the Green Knight, so why should this one technically kill him? I think he does die in a literal sense, yes, but spiritually he is reborn, whether that's in an afterlife or he is literally able to pick up his own head and attach it again, I'm not sure. Like all my videos, these are just my thoughts. The Green Knight is straight up there with my favourite films this year. I first saw it last month when I wrote a review on my Patreon about it the very same day, and if I ever planned to make a video, I imagined it would be something I'd come to a year or so down the line. Normally, I don't re-watch films for a long time, but <laughs> somehow I couldn't get this one out of my head. The music in particular has just sat in my brain for weeks and forced me to re-watch it again and make this video now. So hopefully you enjoyed it, please like it if you did, comment your thoughts, subscribe if you fancy helping me reach the 100,000 mark, and support me on Patreon if you fancy that too, but otherwise... I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. As ever, a special thank you goes to Devin, Kestrel, Arwen, Stephen Lake, Janice McMahon, Luke Corr, Cheech Kaber, Michael Gallagher, Samara Salsi, Sharikov 2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, Incomplete Sentience, Emily Taras, and Nicholas Patrick. Thank you.